Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, or WM, is a low-grade, a slow-growing lymphoproliferative disorder, so a slow-growing lymphoma. Uh, it is, uh, arises in the bone marrow, but in some patients can also have lymph node involvement. The uh, characteristic feature of Waldenstrom's is that these uh, lymphoplasmacytic cells, these uh, white blood cells, produce a protein called IgM. And IgM is a pentamer. It's a very large uh, five-fingered protein, which as it accumulates in the blood, can make the blood quite hyperviscous. And this hyperviscosity, this uh, elevated IgM level, contributes often to the fatigue that can occur with this low-grade lymphoma. In addition to producing this IgM, uh, it can result in a, a reduced production of uh, red blood cells, and anemia uh, is very common in patients with Waldenstrom's, uh, and that anemia itself also contributes to the fatigue. Waldenstrom's is commonly diagnosed because the patient presents with fatigue and that fatigue can be caused by the anemia or the elevated IgM with its hyperviscosity or can just be caused by the disease itself. Uh, Waldenstrom's can also be incidentally diagnosed. Uh, the patient goes for a routine blood checkup uh, and uh, they, the, they have an elevated total protein in their um, electrolyte, their biochemistry panel, uh, and the, the GP goes to investigate that elevated total protein further and they see that they, they, they have this elevated IgM level. Um, other uh, presentations of, of Waldenstrom's are, are, are less common, but they can include uh, the symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, uh, can include uh, you know, other symptoms of an anemia such as, as headache, Blurred vision, uh, while a classic uh, feature of advanced Waldenstrom's as a, as a feature of the hyperviscosity, is actually very uncommon because most people actually present to their GP with their fatigue, uh, with the sort of brain fog, the impaired concentration, uh, before they actually get those symptoms of the blurred vision because of the hyperviscosity um, in, in the retinal uh, vessels. Uh, Muscle cramps are often uh, commonly described by patients uh, as a symptom presenting of their Waldenstrom's. There's really no rhyme or reason why the vast majority of people get Waldenstrom's. Uh, we know there is a predilection uh, for Caucasians uh, and uh, males. Uh, there's usually sort of two, two or three to one uh, male to female ratio. And it's certainly uh, a disease of older people. Uh, people usually are over the age of 60 when they're diagnosed with Waldenstrom's. Uh, and the, the most common sort of diagnostic period is, is, is actually at that time when people have sort of just retired um, and uh, are starting to sort of pay attention to their health and go and uh, see their GP, or they previously attributed their fatigue to sort of, you know, features of ageing, um, you know, being diagnosed in your 60s and early 70s is, is really quite common. Having said that though, there, there really is a spectrum, you know, I have patients uh, as young as in their 40s and obviously patients uh, well into their 80s uh, diagnosed with, with Waldenstrom's. There is, unlike uh, most of the other lymphomas, um, there is a very small familial association with Waldenstrom's and about 7% of patients with Waldenstrom's will have a family member, a close family member, who also has Waldenstrom's or has uh, an IgM monoclonal gammopathy, an elevated IgM uh, paraprotein, uh, which is of uncertain significance because it's not actually associated with uh, symptomatic Waldenstrom's. The most important thing to do with Waldenstrom's in the asymptomatic patient is to educate them and to explain to them the importance of watch and wait because it's not appropriate to treat Waldenstrom's that's not associated with any night sweats, fatigue, uh, new lymphadenopathy, um, not associated uh, with anemia. 
uh, unless the IgM paraprotein is sort of starting to get very high, say, you know, 60 grams uh, or per deciliter or above. Um, so, so that is often the most important uh, management approach initially. But then as the uh, patient starts to get symptoms of their Waldenstrom's, whether it be fatigue, whether it be um, poured concentration, night sweats or cough or s symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, uh, then we have to start talking about treatment. And the treatment approach uh, is, is a tricky one. And for many patients, the first line treatment is a combination of immunochemotherapy rituximab antibody therapy with chemotherapy. And many patients will have uh, be ideally suited to receive rituximab with bendamustine as a frontline chemotherapeutic approach uh, for, for six cycles of our chemo. Um, but other patients in whom, who have had a very, very indolent, a very slow growing progression of their disease, which may have occurred over years, uh, may be better suited to have uh, rituximab in combination with dexamethasone, the steroid uh, tablets, and uh, oral cyclophosphamide tablets without going in too heavy-handed uh, with bendamustine chemotherapy, which can have quite prolonged immune suppressive effects. And uh, there, there really has been very little in, um, in randomized controlled uh, clinical trial data for the frontline treatment of uh, uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. There is one small study uh, in about, I think, about 40 odd patients comparing R CHOP versus R bendamustine, where the R bendamustine certainly had a better, what we call, progression free survival. But that was a really small uh, study, so it's a bit hard to draw definitive conclusions from that. Um, there were a number of patients enrolled in our Innovate study where we compared rituximab monotherapy, rituximab antibody therapy on its own, uh, with rituximab in combination with abrutinib, the new enzyme inhibitor that switches off one of the enzymes that's driving uh, the activity of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, and that clearly showed a significant, uh, quite an impressive uh, advantage in progression-free survival for the patients who had ibrutinib added to their rituximab. But the problem with that randomized controlled trial that was published just uh, last year is that the vast majority of patients uh, had the treatment in the relapse setting and it was only a minority of patients uh, receiving uh, this treatment in the frontline setting. And then the other issue we have is that rituximab monotherapy is not funded in Australia and it's not uh, generally used as a first-line treatment for Waldenstrom's. Uh, so that comparator arm was, was not an ideal comparator arm. And you're then faced with this issue of with these enzyme inhibitors like abrutinib, like xanabrutinib, you're faced with continuous oral treatment. Uh, as opposed to receiving chemotherapy for a finite period. So the, the jury's uh, still very much out on whether it's appropriate uh, to be using rituximab and abrutinib in the frontline setting for Waldenstrom's. And it's certainly very much out in Australia where we have yet to get access to abrutinib on the PBS for patients in the relapsed setting. So for the Australian patient, it's really a discussion with their uh, doctor about the relative merits of rituximab with dexamethasone cyclophosphamide or rituximab with bendamustine. The one thing that I think is an absolute no-no is the use of fludarabine, which is a very potent immune suppressive agent that uh, has been used in the past for treating patients with Waldenstrom's and I think has had, um, you know, is associated with just too much uh, infectious toxicity. So in Australia there is no one treatment used for relapsed Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, we, we don't actually have access to using bendamustine in the relapsed setting uh, in terms of PBS listing uh, so it becomes a discussion with the patient about how they would access bendamustine uh, to add to the rituximab if that was uh, you know, a recommended therapeutic approach. 
um, a lot of the time you can use the same treatment that you've used in the frontline setting. I'm currently having a conversation with a patient of mine about reusing dexamethasone, uh, cyclophosphamide and rituximab after a 14 year remission. Uh, following the use of that uh, therapeutic approach, uh, obviously 14 years ago. Uh, but generally, again, it's rituximab with chemotherapy. Uh, hopefully, uh, within the ALLG, we'll have a new trial available for patients uh, with relapsed Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, but I think that's probably about a year, a year or so away. What is the prognosis for a patient sitting in front of me diagnosed with Waldenstrom's in 2019? Um, it, it obviously depends on how old the patient is, how rapidly growing their disease is, um, and what therapeutic options we have. And there's no doubt that um, once we have access to a brutinib as is available elsewhere uh, in the developed world, uh, that will certainly prolong the uh, overall survival of patients with, with Waldenstrom's. So we're looking well over 10 years. Um, we're looking for many patients uh, well over 20 years. Uh, so it's a really an issue now of not how long will I live, but how well will I live? Uh, how can I manage um, the side effects of my treatment and uh, the long-term consequences of my treatment?